The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. Pastor and author Jonathan Pakluda uses his troubled young adult years to speak truth to the next generation. And I would tell you I'm unbelievably hopeful uh, because I think young adults, 20s and 30s something, they want to do something bigger than themselves. Hmm. And the biggest mistake that we can make as, as their parents or their grandparents is, is to not call them to something great because that's what Jesus did. He called people to greatness. Welcome to Adulting, next. Today, I am Randy Robinson. This is Sheila Walsh. How are you? I'm great, actually. I'm really excited about this guest. Well, evidently, a lot of people are excited. Anybody in the audience excited about tonight's guest? <laughs> See? See? He travels in packs. Uh, yeah. well, and the great thing is, is, is most of those people are the age of my kids. Okay? So they use words like adulting. So we've got the author of a book called Welcome to Adulting because he's reaching a generation with the truth of Jesus Christ. Would you welcome Jonathan Pudluka? Pakluda. Pakluda. Would you welcome Jonathan Pakluda? Hey, thanks for having Sorry. me, guys. How great is this? Come on. JP. We'll just call you JP? Yeah, that's great. It's, JP. it's easier than Pakluda. It, it is. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> so... This is, you know, we were talking about your book before the program, and I'm looking through it going, okay, yeah, it's true, true, man. Oh, great advice, truth, truth, truth. And, but yet, it's had a profound impact. What, why do you think what you had to say in this book is really connecting with a generation? Yeah, I think, you know, I'm sure your, watch, your listeners, your watchers, your viewers have seen uh, young adults leave the church in droves. The, the largest religion growing in America right now is the nuns or the nunners. Uh, I believe they're, they're burnt out on this fake Christianity, you know, this, this idea of, hey, get your act together, you know, put on your Sunday's best, tuck in your shirt, and let's go in here and act like we haven't had an argument in the car on the way to church this morning. And, uh, and they're just burnt out on that. They don't want a replica of their favorite celebrity pastor. They just want someone being real. And listen, I'm not bringing a lot to the table other than uh, I've spent the last decade of my life researching, um, you know, the millennials that, that won't leave your home or uh, the son or daughter or grandson or daughter that you're frustrated with. And I believe that they want something authentic, especially in the church. They want someone being real, talking about their struggles. And so th that's, I wanted to write a book that would be helpful, helpful to both the young adults, but also to parents and to grandparents, you know, to, to give to their young adults yeah. uh, as a subtle Yeah, now, your, your, your background, <laughs> yeah, really. Your background, though, I think is interesting. You, you didn't really grow up, you know, living the, the typical fake Christian life that a lot of young people did um, that would be revolting against that idea. You, you were a little bit of a... I kind of did. I kind of did, Randy. I was I was raised in the church. I had amazing parents, and uh, and I just was rebellious. I mean, right, that's the truth. Right. I just I was I was off. I, I didn't want anything to do with their God, especially when I went to college. Mm -hmm. And so when I got to college, I had all of the freedom that college presents, but none of the responsibility and the maturity to go along with that freedom. And so they say, you know, uh, drug, sex, and rock and roll. In my case, it was drug, sex, and hip hop. And I crammed, you know, a lifetime of partying really into two years of college. And I, I kind of thought of God as this police officer in the sky. And so when I'm doing this, and I didn't want anything to do with that God. I didn't want him to judge me. I didn't want him coming into my life saying, hey, what you're doing is wrong. And so I just kept going that way. And you know, one night I was saying my prayers. I was in my twin size bed in my on-campus apartment and I was praying to God like I always had. And uh, I just started weeping all by myself, started weeping, just sobbing. I thought, nobody's listening to me. You know, these prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. And the next day I called the only person I knew to reach out to. And they said, I, I just confessed my sins to them. I said, hey, this is what I've done over the past several weeks. You know, these are the, these are the choices I've made. These are the sins I've committed. And, and which included, you know, partying, drinking, you know, sex, uh, pornography, all of these things. 
And, uh, and they said, well, that's just kind of college. That's what you do. You just kind of go and you, you, you're wild. And, and then after college, you, you come back to faith. And it was, it was terrible advice, yeah. but it was prophetic in, in, in a way because that's what happened is I continued to party. And then um, after college, I moved to Dallas, Texas, and I was at a bar 16 years ago. And uh, it, was, it was the club uh, that I loved. I had a VIP access to. <laughs> And I bumped into an old friend from college, and they invited me to church. And I went hungover, and I sat in the back row. I still smelled like smoke from the night before. And I just began to wrestle with this idea that I've always said that I believe that, there, that there's a God. But I never had done anything based on that decision. I lived my life however I wanted to do. And when faced with the decision, I thought, well, what do I want to do? And I did that. And, and so really, I thought, you know, what are the odds that I'd be born to the right country? Because if I was born in India, I, I'd probably be Hindu. If I was born in Iran, I might be Muslim. If I'm born in China, I may be Buddhist. What are the odds I'd be born to the right country? So I really had this bias against Christianity. Mm -hmm. And so as I began to explore these world religions, I kept tripping over the character of Christ in history, that every atheist we know acknowledge him by the date they put on their checks, that this guy, this carpenter in Nazareth, a town we would have never heard of except he lived there, who was born in Bethlehem, a town we wouldn't know of except he was born there, he reset the calendar. And as I looked into that and began to study the evidence of the existence of Christ, I trusted my life to him. I realized the, the reason that he became so world famous was because he came back from the grave. Yeah. He rose from the dead. Yeah. And when I trusted in that, that he did that for my sins, that he died for my sins and God raised him from the dead, everything in my life changed. Mm -hmm. Who I hung out with changed, what I did for fun changed, the way I dated changed, the way I talked changed. Eventually, what I did for a living changed. And so when I got into young adult ministry, I, I didn't ha bring a lot to the table other than, man, I love these guys. These are world changers. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that they have so much potential that wants to be unlocked and, um, and just begin to, to pour my life into them and tell that story. When, I'm sorry, uh, you have a good question coming no, up. No, you go I, ahead. I, I just want to, you, you mentioned that these things changed, or, mm -hmm. you know, what you did. They, they're, they're all very external, which I, I believe will yeah. change. Yeah. But something obviously deep changed down here. changed. Yeah. What was that? It was, it was belief. I mean, I, I always say that our behaviors follow what, our belief. Yeah. You know, Christianity is, is it's not a behavior change, behavior change ideal or um, or But it's often, religion. unfortunately, used that way. That's right, because you can change the outside. We can watch, Jesus said, you can watch the outside of the cup. The inside's still nasty. It's got mold and yep. gross stuff in there. It's been sitting in your car for two weeks. I'm just talking about my car. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And so we don't want to start by trying to change the outside. We got to come to this idea of what do I really believe about God? What do I really believe about Christ? Who is he? What did he do for me? And, uh, and when that, when I started there and, and, you know, my wife and I, we kind of came to this realization at the same time because of God's grace and mercy, uh, we began to build on that. And he just did an incredible work in our yeah, lives. There you go. My son's a senior at Texas A&M. And we've, whoop. Kick him. Whoops. Kick him. Oh, whoops. Whoops. Oh. Them, those are fighting words, dude. <laughs> but we were talking about the fact that he said that he feels like on the college campus, A, there's like an epidemic of anxiety mm -hmm. and depression. Mm -hmm. And people might be connected, but desperately lonely. Mm -hmm. Is that something you see? Oh, yeah, for sure. And so I just got back from A&M, and I mean, honestly, there's, God's doing amazing work uh, mm. in that university and on the campus there. Uh, I was there three weeks ago, got to uh, share it there. Uh, a breakaway? Yeah, breakaway. Yeah, my son yeah. goes to that. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, nice. and, uh, and, and so two things you, you talked about is just kind of the social disconnectedness, but also anxiety. And so I want to address both of those. The social disconnectedness is, is we live in this time of social media where you have 5,000 friends and 2,000 followers, but, you, but no one knows you. And you don't have anyone to live out James 5.16, which says to confess our sins to each other and pray for each other so that we may be healed. And so there's this, this facade of depth and facade of relationships, but really you're so un 
unbelievable, lo unbelievably lonely because you, you go back to your apartment and as soon as the power's out, as soon as you're not on your TV, as soon as you're not on your, your cell phone, um, you're, you're by yourself and you realize, hey, I have no real relationships. And it's different than being drunk on the back of a tailgate saying, I love you, man, I love you too. But, but that was one thing that changed when I came into the church. It's just like, man, people took an interest in me and began to pour into me and offer me hope, you know, and, and real uh, reason for living is like, hey, I, I began to find purpose. There's a chapter in the book on purpose. Mm -hmm. And so there's that. And then on, on the topic of anxiety, I think that's true because um, a lot of times anxiety starts in our life of um, caring too much or and not caring too much, but carrying too much. Um, or, or realizing or thinking, believing that we have to do this all on our own. And I like it too. If you ever have been somewhere where you had to put up chairs, if you ever guys had to do that, you know, folding chairs, yes. like at a conference or something, like oh, yeah. you're, you're there and they say, yeah. hey, let's put up the chairs. Sure. And, and so we do that every year. We have this big event and this big retreat and we're putting up chairs. There's thousands of chairs and we're putting them up. And at some point it never fails. Uh, you just hear this huge commotion, this steel hitting the concrete, this loud explosion where somebody dropped the chairs. And the only reason they dropped the chairs is because they carried too many. Hmm. And, um, and I think that's what's happening a lot on these college campuses is, you know, they, they feel all the pressures of this world to, to choose a major and to, to figure all of life out at 20 something. And they're carrying all these chairs. And at some point, uh, you know, they're carrying more than they were made to carry in that season of life, and they just come crashing down. What do you see, God? I mean, you've brought, there's a bunch of your friends here tonight that are part of your church. Come on. <laughs> awesome, pretty awesome. What do you see God doing in the lives of these young people? I'm so glad you asked. Uh, people ask me, they, they say, when you think about the future of the church, are you hopeful or are you discouraged? And I would tell you, I'm unbelievably hopeful uh, because... I think young adults, 20s and 30s something, they want to do something bigger than themselves. Hmm. And the biggest mistake that we can make as, the, as their parents or their grandparents is, is to not call them to something great because that's what Jesus did. He called people to greatness. Mm -hmm. You know, when he, when he met with the rich young ruler, he said, sell everything you have, give it to the poor and follow me. Yeah. When he, he, you know, he, he would interact with people and, and he would say, and he would say, follow me. He said, well, first let me go bury my dad. And he said, well, let, let the dead bury the dead. You follow me. Well, where am I going to stay? Well, listen, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. Don't put your hand to the plow and look back. Follow me. And so the worst thing that we can do is kind of dumb this down and say, oh, you know, just, just show up to church on Sunday. That's such a lame ask. Jesus would say, hey, give me your life. Come and die. Uh, come and follow me. And, and, and to, to connect that to the anxiety, because you think, well, wait a minute, you said they're carrying too much. But remember, he said, my burden is light, yeah. easy. Yeah. You know, my yoke is easy. And so there, he helps us when his spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit comes and works in our life. I mean, he helps us and surround us with people that knows us and loves him and loves us and knows him. We have people to go through life with us to carry our burdens and celebrate our victories. And so when I look at the future of the church, I'm incredibly hopeful because I just see a bunch of world changers mm -hmm. and, and people who want to respond to the gospel mm -hmm. and follow Christ. I had a conversation with a young woman last week and she said to me, um, you know, my boyfriend and I are really committed to each other. We mm -hmm. both love Jesus. I dumped the guy that didn't love Jesus. So... Um, Good for her. <laughs> yeah, but there's a follow-up line. She yeah. said, what's the problem with us sleeping together? Because we're pretty committed. You know, we're pretty yeah. sure. Yeah. What would you say to that? Yeah, I would say, man, I would say God loves you so much. And as, as my friend Todd Wagner, uh, he's, he's a guy who's discipled me, poured into me, says often, he, God doesn't want to rip you off. He wants to set you free. And his word leads to life. And so when, when you, if you want to sleep with that guy, you know, I, I would, you know, he, he should put a ring on your finger, you know, he should put a ring on it, as they say, he should commit his life to you. Sex was made for the context of the covenant of marriage. And it's been well said, it's cliche, but I don't know that I can, could say it better. It's, it's, it's like a fire in a fireplace. It brings warmth and beauty. And it's, it's, it's an incredible 
asset and resource in there. But when that log rolls out of that fireplace, it will burn the house down and it will destroy a family. And sex or intimacy as God created it, because God invented sex. He's, he's the author of it. He made the parts and he made them work the way they do. And it's his beautiful invention. And so he gets to tell us how, how we should have that. And so with the, the problem with that, that young woman is she's trusting God in one aspect of her life, uh, 2 Corinthians 6.14, um, but she's not trusting him in 1 Corinthians 6, 18 and 19 and 20, you know, flee sexual immorality. And so um, she's getting, she's picking and choosing which of the scriptures she wants to listen to. I think that's one of the things that's the strongest about this book. I mean, I'm thinking of you, if your grandmother or your mother, and you're thinking, wow, I wish I'd told my kids this. It is not too late. I mean, this book is really going to inform those people in your life you care about. And honestly, I wish I'd read it when I was 18. I mean, there's so much. <laughs> well, they're, they're, worth, they're worth reading now. I, I realize the book is a little bit targeted towards those just a little bit younger than us. Oh, please, hello. But the truths, the truths apply to Younger than you, Randy. Uh, younger than me, not her. Okay, fair enough. All right, yeah. my younger sister, Sheila. I like him. But, but the truths, uh, they don't I know. stop at any age. It's this like is something, saying, read the word of God and live it. Don't uh, yeah, just it is. pretend. And it's even to the point where if, if you are a little frustrated, you feel like you haven't matured, maybe spiritually like you should have, whatever age you are, the truths here are the truths in the Bible, just put into a language that we can apply and mm -hmm. understand a little better. Uh, I like what you said. You're talking about the, the don'ts in Scripture. And one of our guests on the show recently said, I started reading don't in the Bible as don't hurt yourself by. Mm -hmm. Don't hurt yourself by committing adultery, mm -hmm. you know. And when you, when you look at it that way, you realize, okay, it's not a God who's just sitting up there waiting for us to fail so he can mm -hmm. tell us we just failed. Mm -hmm. It's a God who's sitting up there just waiting for us to come to him so he can lift us up mm -hmm. and make us succeed. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of maturity that I see that you're showing to a generation and they're latching onto it because they're hungry yeah. for something beyond just the show. Yeah. They need the know. Yeah. He's, he's telling that young woman, don't run out in the street, you know, where there's cars, because yeah. I'm crazy about you. And everything about me, God, everything about him uh, desires to lead us to life yeah. so that we might have it abundantly. He's not, he's not trying to rip us off. He's yeah. trying to set us free. And, you know, the reason I think your message is so important, JP, is, you know, you, you and I actually published with the same publisher. Mm. But every now and again, God puts his hand on a book. You know, and you can have great marketing people as we both do, but every now and again, God says, this is a message for now. And I really believe that that's why God's got his hand on this book, because this is a message that I believe if we embrace, then a world that is dying would perhaps look at us because we're living Thank and you, living in a way that Jesus, so I just pray, I just pray God's increase on your book. Thank you so much, friend. I appreciate that so much. There is something that uh, you can do to change the world. There's something that you can do to do something great. There's something you can do that moves beyond yourself, that moves beyond the mundane things of life and the ordinary problems that we have. You can move out there and really change a life. You can actually save a life. And I would like you to get Jonathan's book. Uh, we would like to send it to you, but we want you to help us as we help others and we'd like to show you how. Would you watch this, please? East Africa. Many would see exceptional beauty in the wildness of its terrain, but the families struggling to survive here every day see a very different landscape. One marred by loss and darkened by grief, Claudine, a single mother in the remote village of Uganda, is all too familiar with this view. It always seems to come down to the same issue everywhere I go, and that is their water source. Mm -hmm. 
ubwo badufise nuko tufise kuyanwa akazo tugira ingaro kambe kandi n'ubundi byama byaba tukipfutsa n'icyo duheretse amatsi meza na tutubagirana tukabona gutera imbere I have come to know that there is a solution. There is something that works. The truth is there's water underneath my feet. And I know that we could drill a well that will go deep enough to hit clear, fresh, clean, healthy water. To keep food, and a divine opportunity awaits us. An immense need and a viable solution at a critical time. With your partnership, we can bring hope and health to countless families in desperate need of our help. You know, Sheila, she, she says when you put your faith in God, He provides. And I know there's people watching right now who have faith in God and they're the provision. You know, it's so interesting because when I've walked on these um, places in Angola where, or Burundi, you know, it's easy to watch it on TV and think, oh, that's, that's terrible. But when you're actually there and you see what it's like, these, these moms have no choice. You know, the only water that's available for hundreds of miles are these dirty puddles. And I've watched these children drink the only water that's available. And I've wept with mothers who've lost, like that mom, two children and are so afraid they'll, they'll lose the others. But they have no choice. You can't give your children nothing. So they just give them what they have and then they pray. I think one of the greatest adventures in this life is to get to be the answer to the prayers of people we've never actually even met. Maybe you watch that story of that mom and you think, I want to be the answer to her prayer. Well, it's so doable. Our goal for this year, for 2019, is we want to put 200 new water wells into villages. I've been in the villages where there's nothing. I've stood beside a mom at the grave of her latest little one. And I've been in a village where we've put in a water well. And the difference is literally night and day, death and life. Would you help us? <laughs> Actually, those 200 wells, that's just the beginning of the year. That's how we're going to start the year. With your help, we will far exceed that this year. We're looking into 15 nations where we have provided drinking water in the past, clean drinking water, and we want to expand in those areas and, and just bless more people. Let me break this down for you. One well, on average, costs $4,800 to drill that well to put it in place. So here's how it works out. Your gift of $48 will on average reach 10 people for a lifetime with clean drinking water. Clean drinking water changes everything for the people in these villages. I've been there, I've stood there at a well, I was just at one not too long ago in Africa. And this is a place, it's, it's interesting because we, we talk about community. Sheila, have you ever noticed that that water well becomes a point of community? People gather at the well, mm. just like in biblical times. Yeah. And they come there for clean, fresh drinking water because it gives them life. So as we go and we share the life and love of Christ in the gospel, will you go with us and demonstrate the gospel for these people by giving them that fresh, clean drinking water? It saves lives. Go to the phone right now. Go online. Give the best gift you can. Help us put arms of love around the world through Water for Life. Today, a mother living in extreme poverty will do the unthinkable. Give her children dirty, disease-filled water that she knows could kill them. With no other choice, what's a mother to do? With your help, clean water is on the way. Mission Water for Life provides a way for parents to save the lives of their children, to offer them a bright future free from the fear of death. With your gift today, you can help drill and establish the first 200 water wells of the year. Your gift of $24 will help provide clean water for five children. A gift of $48 will help provide for 10. $72 will provide for 15. And $144 will help provide life-giving water for 30 people for a lifetime. With your gift, we'll send you the Praying Grace 55-Day Devotional. This new devotional will help you renew your mind to the realities of God's grace and help you pray powerful grace-based prayers for each day. 
With your gift of $100 or more, request the Praying Grace Tumbler. This reusable 16-ounce container is constructed with insulated stainless steel, perfect for hot or cold beverages. Finally, please consider a gift of $1,200 to help provide water for 250 people, or a gift of $4,800 to help sponsor a complete well. And you may request the beautiful new commemorative bronze sculpture, Safe in the Shepherd's Arms. Please call, write, or make your gift online. Let me show you a water source that these kids are, are drinking from. And it's, uh, it's really, literally, with no exaggeration, contaminated water. And they let this uh, bucket down and they get the water. But it's not sealed and, and controlled and capped. They're making do with what they have, but that's not good enough. It's not going to help them to be healthy. You know, they've, they've got this dirty, filthy, contaminated water to work with. They have to drink it to even survive a day. And I know that there couldn't be a greater joy from the parents of these children, James, than to be able to watch their children grow up. Well, they won't be able to do that if they don't have some fresh water, because after a while, the disease is going to kill them. Well, and we're the answer to that problem, all of us working together, each person doing what they can, because we know the need is very real. We want you to see it up close and personal. But the thing we really want you to hear and know, you're really the answer. You're the, the way to provide hope and help to people who deserve it. You know, we talk a lot about love. We talk about the love of God a lot in churches. But how often do we demonstrate it? You know, we talk so often on life today about love, not in word only, but in deed. And drilling freshwater wells, that's love indeed. Help us do it. Dial that telephone number and make the very best gift you can. Please do it and do it now. Please make the gift, or you can go on lifetoday.org and make that gift online. Thank you so much. If the lines are busy, keep calling. We can change the world. But I'm, I really love this book. I mean, the minute I heard about it, I bought a copy and sent it to my son. So I really encourage you to get a hold of it. And for any gift at all, we will send you a copy of Welcome to Adulting. I don't care whether you're 18 or 78. There's something you can sure. learn in this book. Thank our amazing guest, yes. JP. It's been an Thank honor to so have much. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Hey, we so appreciate much. you being here and bringing these great people with you. You guys celebrate at theporch.live the online, so be sure to check out their website. You can always visit live today and visit us again right here tomorrow. Thank you. When planning your future, keep their future in mind. Contact Life Planning Services today. Best-selling author Ted Decker shares how his passion for exploring truth through mind-bending stories began by being born to missionary parents in Indonesia. Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.